You know, this morning, we come unto the Lord and we give gratitude for all that He is. And we are part of the church. We are part of God's body. God's body of believers that He shed His blood for and He died for. And in the book of Revelation, John is, is writing uh, to uh, seven churches in Asia Minor. Seven churches that had its share of problems and its share of difficulties. Seven churches that were real churches that experienced real problems. And, and he writes to a letter to each of the seven churches and that's how Revelation starts. Revelation is a book that primarily deals with the last days, with uh, what is going to happen in the future, the doctrine of eschatology, the doctrine of the last days. But it is interesting to me that the Apostle John starts off in Revelation speaking to the church. And I believe that right now we are living in the church age. We are living in the dispensation of grace. We are living in a time to where grace is available to all who will receive and call upon His name. Amen. We are living in a time where salvation is available to all those who will repent and call upon His name. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. You see, the church is the body of Christ. You are a part of the church, the corporate body of Christ, which ju just doesn't include Bakerfield. It includes all of those who are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And Revelation chapter number 1, Revelation chapter number 1, we're going to be in parts of Revelation chapter number 1, and we're going to be in Revelation chapter 2 as we start a series on the seven churches of Revelation. The seven churches in Revelation. And we're going to be in, we're going to be in verse number, Revelation chapter number 1, verse number 12. And we're going to read uh, all the way through chapter 2 and verse number 7. So when you get there, say amen and rise to your feet for the reading of God's infallible and errant inspired and authoritative word. Revelation chapter number one. Oh, I couldn't hear that stand. <laughs> Revelation chapter number one, starting in verse number 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, amen, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, amen, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be, Hereafter, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars 
are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. And has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not faded, fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Repent, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of this place except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. You may be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, as we open up Your Word today and we learn about this particular church and we learn about the setting in which uh, this church is located, God, I pray that You will speak to this church, God, and You will allow us to apply the principles that we learn today to our own lives and how we can become more passionate followers of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that everything that is said and done will bring glory and honor to You. Lord, I ask that you would give me the unction to proclaim, Thus saith the Lord God, and to do so with boldness that will confront the coldness in our land. And God, I pray for each and every believer that is here. Lord, I pray that they would be strong in the Lord and in the power of your might. And I pray, Lord, that if anybody here today has come in with a bond, with bondage, that has came in with a stronghold, God, that they will rely on you, for you are the only one that can break that bondage. You are the only one who can deliver them from that stronghold. And you are the God who does that. And God, I thank you, Lord, for your grace. And I thank you, Lord, for your mercy. I thank you, Lord, for your blood. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, for everyone that is here. And I pray many blessings upon their lives. In Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, here we're in Revelation chapter number one. Of course, Revelation was written to seven churches within Asia Minor. And it was written at a time at where there was a cruel and hateful dictator by the name of Domitian. And in that day and time in which John is writing, John was, was sent to the Isle of Patmos because of his stance for Jesus Christ. And because he would not bow down to the emperor, he was sent there to Patmos. And it is there that he sees this vision. And it is this letter that is being communicated to the, le to, the se to the seven different churches of Asia Minor. Seven churches that John knew of and, and John probably had a relationship with. And these were seven unique churches. Each church, no matter where you go to, is unique. It's unique wherever you go. And and it's just like Bakerfield is unique. And B Bakerfield is a wonderful church. And I love you all and I appreciate you all. But this particular church that he's writing, that he's writing to here, he's talking to the church of Ephesus. And we're going to be talking about Ephesus. And But before that, we see a setting. And we see that, that he sees these seven golden candlesticks. Now, what we're going to find out is these seven golden 
candlesticks represent something. You see, in the book of Revelation, there is symbolism in the book of Revelation. But in the book of Revelation, a lot of times as you read through Revelation, you will find that there's always an explanation of what the symbols mean. And so the symbols are to be taken literally. Whenever you read Re Revelation, you're to interpret it from a literal perspective. In other words, these things are real. These things are going to come to pass. But here he is writing to the here and now. See, I believe that we are living in the church age. And we can apply what is going to be taught today to our lives so that we can be more effective in the world in which we live. But here in Revelation chapter number 1, he sees... Seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of these seven candlesticks is one like unto the Son of Man. I want you to know that in the midst of the church, because that is what the candlesticks represent. The candlesticks represent the seven churches. It represents the church. And we must realize that at the center of everything that we do, at the center of how we conduct ourselves, at the center of how we run the church, it has to, the, the center of it has to be Jesus. The center of it has to be the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And without Him as the center, without Him as the foundation, without Him as the rock that we rely upon each and every day, we're going to fail. Because if we try to do church in our own flesh, if we try to do church in our own mindset, we will fall every time. But if we rely upon the lion of the tribe of Judah, if we rely upon the Most High God, if we rely upon the Everlasting Father, if we rely upon the Prince of Peace, and we say we rely upon Him for the power for this very hour that God will see us through and God will make us strong and ready to take on the, the, the whatever problems that we may face and whatever obstacles that we may encounter. And so he's reminding, he's seeing God in the center. He's seeing God right in the midst. And I want you to know that we need God in the church. We need God in America. We need God all over the world. We need God in our homes. We need God in our family. We need God to be right in the center of everything that we do. Amen. And God is the one that is represented in verse number 13. Jesus, the Son of the living God. He's known as the Son of Man because, and He's called the Son of Man because He was born of a virgin. And he lived 2,000 years of a perfect sinless life. But when he came, he was born with human flesh. And he lived among us. And the reason why he did so is because he could identify with a common man. You see, Jesus, when he was born, he wasn't born in a palace. He wasn't born, he wasn't born in a rich mansion. He was born in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. He was born in a countryside. He was born in the midst of animals. Animals. He was born with the lowest of low so he could identify with a poor man, so he could identify with people who go through problems, so he could identify with people who go through valleys, so he could identify with people who go through the storms, so he could identify with people. And I'm thankful that he is a God that understands what it is to go through life because he had to go through life and he was tempted as every man was, but he came back without sin. He came and he he was perfect in everything that he said and done and he went to the cross and he died for the church he died for the people of the church and he died for the world and he that is free in Christ is free indeed and he said upon this rock I'm going to build my church and it don't matter what the devil tries to do the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of a living God Amen. And he's clothed with a garment down to the foot. 
and girdle about the paps with a golden girdle. You see, my God is clothed with royalty. My God is not a poor God. My God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. My God is Jehovah Jireh. My God is on the throne. And my God is clothed in royalty. My God has a crown that is above any crowns. My God is a God that is greater than any potentate. My God is a God that is greater than any king. My God is a God that is greater than any president. And his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. You see, my God is a wise God. You see, my God is a God who his hairs were white like wool. He has white hair and he's white like wool and, and he's pure and he's pure and he's holy, white like snow and his eyes were as a flame of fire seeing yes, God is a God of love but I can also say that God is a God of judgment and God is a God of wrath and God is a God who means business Business. And God is a God who wants His church to follow Him. Amen. And it is in this setting that God gives this message to John, the Revelator. And it says, And His feet were like unto fine brass, as if they burn in, his fur in a furnace. And His voice is the sound of many waters. You see, when God speaks, when God speaks, oh, it's not, uh, it's not a soft voice that you can't hear. It's not in a whisper, amen. It's in a voice that is loud and booming and God's Word speaks. God's Word thunders through the time. God's Word has no time barrier. It transcends time. And His voice, His voice can, can, can override your, 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 uh, the, 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 uh, the things that you go through. His voice speaks in the, in the midst of the trial. His voice carries in the midst of confusion. His voice is real. And His voice speaks in this day and time. And it says, And He had in His hand, right hand seven stars. And out of His mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And His countenance was as a sun shineth in His strength. Woo! His countenance shone like the sun. His glory radiates the place. His glory is all over the place. And when we get to heaven, there will be no more need of the sun because His light will light the city. And His, and, and, and his countenance was as the sun that shines in His strength. See, we serve a strong God. We serve a worthy God. We serve an all-powerful, on-time, every-time kind of God. We serve a God that doesn't operate like people do. We serve a God that is trustworthy. We serve a God that is worthy and reliable. We serve a God that won't ever let us down. Well, sometimes in life, people will let you down. Amen? Amen. But God will never let us down. And he says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Oh, you know, he had a reverence for God. When he saw him, all he could do was fall at the feet of Jesus. All he could do was fall in utter reverence and utter awe for what Jesus is and who he is. I think we need to understand that Jesus is worthy of reverence. Amen. He's worthy of honor and he's worthy of respect. You see, you would think that people would, would respect their earthly father. But a lot of times, that's not the case. A lot of times, people don't respect their earthly father. And in return, when they grow up, they don't respect their heavenly father either. You see, I believe in respect. And I believe we must respect authority. Kids that don't respect authority grow up and they become, uh, well, they, they don't always turn out well. Our prisons are full of people who don't respect authority. Amen. Amen. That's right. 
It is important for young people to respect authority because no matter how old you get, no matter who you are, no matter uh, what you do in life, you're always going to have authority. And when you don't respect authority, you are in trouble. Amen, brother. So he fell at his feet as dead. He respected the authority and majesty of God. Amen. And notice what he says. He says, he laid his right hand upon me, saying to me, fear not. I am the first and the last. You see, Jesus is the first and the last. Jesus has always been. Jesus has had no beginning. Jesus has always been. He was there at the time of creation. He was there when he when when it said, "Let us create man in our own image." And there you see the first mention of the Trinity. And Jesus says, "Fear not. I don't want you to be afraid, John. I am the first, and I am the last." I am where the buck stops. The buck stops right here. I am in charge. I am he that liveth and was dead. In other words, I am he that is alive. I'm not, al I'm not dead anymore. I am alive and alive forevermore. And we don't serve a dead God. Amen. We don't serve a sleeping God. We don't serve a, we, we don't, we don't, we, we serve a God that never takes a break. He's always on the phone and Jesus is on the main line and all you got to do is tell him what you want. I am he that liveth and was dead. I was, I was crucified and I was buried and I was dead for three days and then I got up out of that grave. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. In other words, amen means let it be. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. Jesus has the keys yeah. of death. Yeah. He has the keys, and 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 guess what? He, when he when he went to the cross, he conquered hell. He conquered death. And when he rose again, he 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 is and he rose again, and he's sitting on the right hand of the Father, and he's waiting on us. He's waiting for his people to join him one day. Amen. And he says, John, I want you to do something for me. I want you to write these things. I want you to write it down. I want you to take a pen and write it down what I have told you. The things which are. The things which are currently going on right now in this present in this present day and the things which shall be hereafter. In other words, the things that shall soon come to pass. And then he explains what the seven stars are. The mystery of the seven stars in verse 20, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now there's been much uh, scholarly input into who the seven churches. Uh, stars are. It, it refers to them as the angels of the seven churches. Uh, I, I, I tend to believe that maybe it could refer to a guardian angel perhaps, but I tend to believe that maybe who he's writing to here are the messengers, the pastors of the seven churches. And the seven sat candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So here the symbolism is being interpreted. The symbolism is telling us what, what it means. So these seven candlesticks are seven literal real churches that were in that day and time. And so he has a message for them. And that is the context in which chapter 2 begins. So in chapter number 2, it says unto the angel of the church in Ephesus, right. In other words, unto the pastor, unto the messenger. Uh, and God everywhere has his messengers. And, and, and no messenger is more important than the other. Amen. You see, there are messengers in small churches. There are messengers in medium-sized churches. There are messengers in large churches. But each one is important to God. And for those that are, that are watching, for those that will be watching, if you are a pastor, I just want to say, I appreciate what you do for God. Amen. Amen. And I pray for you. 
Amen. We pray for you. Amen. Amen. It says, Unto the angel of the church of the Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. And I'm thankful that God holds his messengers. God holds his pastors. God holds his messengers in his hand. So no matter what the devil tries to do to discourage he, to discourage God's uh, messenger, and yes, the devil will try to discourage pastors. The devil will try to discourage the pastor because he knows if he can discourage the pastor, then he can take a church down. Amen. Amen. The devil works overtime on messengers. Amen. The devil works overtime on God's man. These things saith he that holdeth his seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, who walks in the midst of the seven churches, of the seven churches. He says, I know thy works. You see, Jesus is saying he knows what you're about. He knows who you are. He knows everything about you. He knows the, the hair the very hairs on your body. He knows how many you have. And he knows how many you don't have. Amen. Woo. Woo. Amen. Amen. Whether you're bald yeah. or whether you got a hair full of head, he knows everything about you. Amen. He knows what's going to happen before it happens. He's already there in the future and he's already got it worked out. All I have to do is just say, Jesus, take my hand. Jesus, hold my hand and lead me. And guide me and direct me. No, I may not have all the answers. No, I may I may not understand certain situations. No, I may not understand it all because I am a human and I think with a human per perspective and sometimes I fail. Right. But I serve a God that is never, that is never failing. Right. And I serve the great shepherd. And if I get behind the great shepherd and I follow him, he will guide me. To the path on the path that I need to go. I know thy works and thy labor. I know how hard you've worked. I know how hard you've labored, church. I know how you have been in the midst of persecution. And this was a church that was right smack dab in the persecution. This was the church of Ephesus. And this was a church that was in a bustling city. Ephesus was a big, huge city in that day. Ephesus was like Atlanta. You know, Atlanta has a lot of activity, a lot of things going around, and this was a center in, 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 uh, that a lot of people went to, that a lot of people traveled to. And in that city was a lot of different, uh, uh, different uh, forms of religion, and they served and they worshipped other gods. And it is in that city where they had to deal with the worship of Artemis. And Artemis was a, the fertility goddess. And, and she was somebody that they built a temple to in Ephesus. And they worshipped her. And they paid homage to her. And they had all kinds of orgies. And all kinds of activities. And they prayed to her. And they believed in her. And they believed in the false god. And the truth of the matter is they believed in an idol. They believed in something that, that wasn't God. And that's what exactly is going on in a lot of people today. Day, people worship Amen. people worship many gods except the one true God they're worshiping a little god they're worshiping a no god because that god can't answer your prayer that god can't uh can't hear your cry that god can't provide for you that god can do nothing for you Amen. but yet people would would carve out idols and worship them and would erect a statue in the Old Testament and worship it as if it was a God and as if it could answer them. But all throughout the Old Testament we see how God shows that He is the only God and He is the only God that is worthy of worship and worthy of our praise. And He says, I know these things. I know your labor. I know what you've done. I know what you haven't done. And I know what you will do. And I know your patience. 
I know how you have labored patiently. I know how you have patiently waited upon the Lord. I know how you have done these things and how you cannot bear them which are evil. Here, he is giving a word of commendation. He is speaking uh, brightly to the people. He is, he is clarifying some things. He is saying, these are the things that I'm happy about. These are the things that I am glad that you do as a church. You are you can't bear them which are evil. You hate sin. You don't like sin. You don't like people who are evil. You don't like evil. Amen. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. In other words, this was a church that was doctrinally sound. And doctrine means something taught. Doctrine is an important thing in church. Because if there is no sound doctrine, then you will have people going to and fro, believing whatever they want to believe, and they're not believing the truth. Uh -huh. Amen. Amen. And so they, they, they found these, they, 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 they studied the scriptures. And they went to the Word to see if what these so-called apostles were saying. And they found that what they say is not the truth. You see, a lot of times what we have on TV today is false teachers. You see, we have, a, we have this, these people that get on TV and they promise you your miracle. If you will just sow a seed. If you will just give your money, if you will just give your money, uh, they will send you a prayer cloth. And that prayer cloth will heal your body. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know that that's a bunch of hogwash and slop? Yeah. That's just an attempt to get people's money. And do you know that people fall prey to that and they pay into it and there are some people getting rich off of it? Amen. Amen. Now these these kind of people are out there in force today. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Now, not e now, now I'm saying not everybody on TV is a false prophet. Yeah. There are some out there that are preaching the word of God and they are making an impact through technology. They are making an impact yeah. through through uh, through spreading the word of God. Yeah. You see, and I believe that technology uh, can be used for bad. But I also believe that technology can be used to impact people's lives Amen. for Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I don't believe that technology should take the place of church, but I believe it can add to the church and it can be a tool that you can use to help people in this life. Amen. Uh, but anyway, the, the, these were people that they, they were doctrinally sound. They knew what they believed. They were certain of what they believed. They had been taught what right. Because after all, the person who founded, who was made the first pastor of Ephesus was put in there by the Apostle Paul and his name was Timothy. And Timothy became the pastor of the church of Ephesus some 20 years before. And he was in, and he was there during the during the time when there was persecution and and he has seen that thou, how that they had patience and how for he, for for the Lord's name's sake they have labored in verse number three and has not fainted. In other words, they they had patience and they would not give up. To faint means that you fall down. To faint means you just throw in the towel. To faint means you just give up. There are many times in life where the easy thing to do would be to give up. Would be just to say, you know, I've had enough of it. Yeah, yeah. And this was a church that experienced persecution because this was a church that was under the, the reign of Domitian. And Domitian was under was the one of the cruelest dictators who ever lived. In fact, he persecuted and killed Christians. And it is under that context in which John is writing to the church in Ephesus, and Jesus has a message for the church in this context. But there was something that God had against this church. And 
amidst all of their good doctrine, there was a problem. Yes, they were doctrinally sound, but they had doctrine, but they had no passion. They had no zeal. They had no fervor. They had no passion for God. They were dried up, spiritually speaking. You see, a church with sound doctrine without passion is just dead orthodoxy. Hello? Hello. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but I serve a risen Savior. Amen. Amen. And He gets me excited about Amen. coming to church. Amen. But these people, He said, nevertheless, I have something against you. Because you, thou, has left thy first love. Amen. Thou has left it. Yeah. Thou has turned away from it. Now it's interesting to me. How could this church turn away in such a short period of time? After all, Timothy was just instituted as the pastor of a church for some 20, some 20 years ago, which tells me that Timothy was probably no longer the pastor in Ephesus. Because Timothy was a great pastor. Timothy was mentored by the Apostle Paul. So in this particular case, he probably was not there anymore as the pastor. Where he was, it does not say. But, uh, but something happened in that church. They went from spirit field to just going through the motions. And, and it all happened in a short period of time. They, they went from having a hallelujah time to just coming into the church like some people and looking at their watch and saying, when's the pastor going to get done? I'm ready to leave. Amen. And they come out of duty instead of out of marvel, instead of out of actually being excited to be in church. This was a church that was spiritually lethargic. Going through the motions. Yes, they had good doctrine. And yes, he, he complimented them on those things. But this is a big point here. They had left their first love. They had left, they had left who really mattered. And they had... They had gotten all, all they got mixed up with just this idea of being religious. Of just coming for the sake of coming. Meeting for the sake of meeting. Going through the routines. Traditionalism. Yeah. Amen. Now I'm not saying there's anything wrong with traditions. We all have traditions. But tradition with no power. Church with no power. Church with no emotion. Church with no enthusiasm. Church with no excited with no excitement. Oh, I'm excited to be in church. Thank Woo! Yes. Amen. Glory. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. He's saying, I want you to correct this. I, 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 I'm looking at, the, at this church and I'm looking at you, Ephesus. And I'm paying attention. I'm looking at you, church in America. I'm looking at you, people. I'm watching you. And I wonder, have you left your first love? Amen. Amen. Have you left your adoration? Is he everything in your life? Is He what drives you each and every day? Is He what excites you? Is He what makes you glad? Is He what gives you the oil of gladness so that you may worship and praise the Lord? Amen. Does He give you joy? Yes. Does He light your fire? Yes. Yes. I'm sorry, but if you don't get excited about the Word and your wood is wet, Amen. Amen. and you need to get excited... 
You need a power. You need to be rejuvenated. You need to be revived. Amen. And then he says in verse number five, repent therefore from whence thou art fallen. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. In other words, remember how great you were. Remember how passionate you were. Remember these things. Remember how, how, how wonderful you felt when it was to be a Christian. You weren't ashamed of it. And you weren't ashamed to, to speak the name of Jesus. You weren't ashamed to share your faith. You weren't ashamed to praise the Lord. You weren't ashamed to lift your hands. You weren't ashamed to clap your hands. You weren't ashamed to shout. Amen. Don't let your shout go out. Amen. And I, I, some people need to get under the spout where the glory comes out. Amen. And some people need to quit pouting and start shouting. Amen. And when the glory comes into the house, Amen. the confused become convinced and the doubters become shouters. But you've left your first love. And you need to repent. Amen. And you need to do the first works. You need to go back. And you need to do what you were known for. You need to do what you were known for in the past. You need to remember that. You need to remember how you had a great pastor. You need to remember how he stood in the pulpit and he preached with the fire of God and the thunder came out of his... The thunder from, from down under came out of his soul and it came out of his soul and it burst forth into the lives of people and they were excited and enthusiastic about being in the house of God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord. It says, repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee, to thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of this place, except thou offend, except thou repent. In other words, I will remove your effectiveness. I will remove your, your, your prominence. I will remove... You from this place, except thou repent. So you can be restored. People can be restored. The church can be restored. But only if they, and only if we repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. See, the Nicolaitans were a group of people that <clears throat> they were a false uh, cult, so to speak. And they hated the, the deeds of them. They hated what they stood for. And they, and they stood for the Word of God. But my friends, we not only need to have doctrine, but we need to have passion. I don't want to just come to church and just go through the motions. I don't want to be a church known as something that's spiritually lethargic. Some, some, something that's apathetic. You just come whenever you feel like it. I want to have a Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Praising Jesus. Whooping on the devil. Good time. Amen. A hallelujah time. Amen. He that hath an ear, Amen. let him hear Amen. what the Spirit Amen. is saying to the churches. Amen. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. In other words, he's going to give them some, some good fruit. He's going to give them of the tree of life. And the tree of life was there in the Garden of Eden. And Adam and Eve had the tree of life there. And because they sinned, they were separated from the presence of God and from, from the tree of life. But in heaven, we will see the tree of life. And, and the tree of life is there to, to uh, restore people and, and to provide sustenance and to pro provide food. And I look forward to one day eating from the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. 
Are you hearing Amen. what the Spirit is saying? Amen. Amen. Are you hearing what He's saying to the church? Amen. The church in Ephesus was a church that was about doctrine, but it was a church that lost its passion, lost its fire, lost its zeal. And He says, you need to repent. Come back to your first love. Come back to Jesus. Come back to the One who brings the, th who brings the thunder. Come back to the One who brings the power. Come back to the One who brings the fire. Amen. 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 Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I come to You today. And I thank You for the opportunity to be in Your house. I pray for the opportunity to get in Your Word and study Your Word and what Your Word has to say to the church. And this is just the first of the seven churches in Revelation. And God, this, this passage of Scripture is applicable to the church today. And God, I pray that we would not become spiritually lethargic I pray that we would not become apathetic with God, that we would become people who were on fire for God and revived by the power of God and, and passionate and, 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 and not afraid to let their shout go out. Amen. Praise the Lord. And Lord, I'm thankful for You. And I know each and every one of us have a, has a light. And... This little light of mine, well, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, oh, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, oh, let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No! I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No! I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No! I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Oh, let it shine. Shine on till King Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Shine on till King Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Shine on till King Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Oh, let it shine. Amen. Amen. And Lord, and, and Lord, help us to be that light that shines. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're going to give an invitation, and that invitation is simple. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then what you need to do in order that that light will shine is that you need to give your life to Jesus Christ. You don't need to put it off. Not, not tomorrow, but today. Today is the day of salvation. And what you need to do is put your faith and trust in Jesus. Say, Lord, come in and be the Savior of my life and save me and set me free. And Jesus will do that. And if you do know Jesus, perhaps what you need is just a, is a dose of revival. Perhaps you need is to, to stop letting your wood be wet and get on fire. And get to shouting and get to praising Jesus for all that He is and all that He's done for us. I, I, let's go to the let's let's let the Lord do His business. Let's sing the stanzas from this song and and let God do business in your soul. God bless.